you'll see some some diff some familiar faces in the in the room today, and you won't see anyone named Scott. Um, if you saw our email go out this morning, Scott unfortunately is dealing with some um, fire drills as they come for work, and so he's got his his ear full of um, that to, to handle today. But we've got um, a great Plan B, which I think is very timely given a lot of the developments in the news and some of the announcements we've seen um, within the last 24 hours, let alone the last week. So. Um, you, if you've been following our sandbox journey, you'll remember Inesh from our very first sandbox, uh, well, almost about six months ago now. Um, so he he joined us for our asking better questions session, leads our product efforts, and Shmuel, who joined us for a great working session or a kind of conversation with a couple of other leaders around adopting AI and figuring out how to build a winning AI strategy. He leads kind of our AI automation wheelhouse, which is very simple title for a lot of um, exciting, important developments that have transformed our product in the last couple of months. So we're going to focus today's conversation on just working through some of the recent headlines, getting Shmuel and Inesha's take, um, answering any questions you might have, if you have any hot takes or, or questions around what certain abbreviations or developments might mean, or you know how to use any of the new things that have been released in your day-to-day, -day, please feel free to chime in, take your self off mute, kind of ask questions. We'll make this conversational. I know our team has lots of questions and interested in learning more. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll hand the mic over to Inesh and Shmuel to just kind of add any other context you might want to add to your intro. And then if there's either a favorite or most interesting development that you're keeping an eye on, um, we can maybe start things there. Cool. Yeah, I can start. Hi everyone, my name is Inesh. I lead the product team here at Wonder. I've been with uh, with the company for almost seven years now. Uh, so got to uh, had the privilege of seeing a lot of different iterations of of how do you build through evolving technologies, and that is something that I'm personally just super excited about. I think there's never been as exciting of a time to build, uh, especially in, in the knowledge space, as there is today. And as for the you know, recent developments, it's kind of like every every new day, there's a different thing. Um, I think one thing that I just maybe principally very excited for is just more players joining in and overall driving the cost of a lot of these very performant models down. Um, I think we do a lot of experimentation and I'm sure we'll, Shmi and I will touch on this, that, you know, that helps us understand where things are cost prohibitive. Uh, and I think that there's some really cool stuff, especially with the latest, um, latest news from OpenAI and GPT-4 Turbo to get those models out. And I'm sure there's going to be more players in the space. And also OpenAI consistently trying to drive drive the price down for the same level of performance. Cool. And uh, on my end, uh, my name is Shmuel. I do uh, all things uh, AI, architecture, and engineering uh, here at Wonder. Uh, I've been here for around six years. Uh, and I can uh, just echo the uh, excitement and enthusiasm from uh, Victoria and, and, and uh, Inesh. A lot of uh, very fascinating developments. Cool. So maybe to get started, it feels like the biggest one to unpack is everything that came out of Dev Day. Um, I know you mentioned Turbo and sort of the accelerated horsepower there. Um, there's this whole element of GPTs that people can create their own I don't even know what we'd call it, like your interface, your own kind of custom instructions that are packaged up and easily accessible. Um, so maybe we start with the the horsepower side of things with the turbo piece and how we're thinking about um, what does that mean? How other, com what is it? There's also this element that I think we'll, we'll pull the thread on throughout this conversation where some of these developments could put some of these players who come onto the scene in the last couple of months you know, 10 steps back that suddenly now something got democratized that they sort of were starting to build a moat around and at the same time create new opportunities for either new businesses or new innovations or new solutions that tools introduce or companies introduce. So if and as you have thoughts there around like what this now just opened up for people or what, you know, where the bar now goes because of this new development, happy to dig into that and in anything we talk about. But let's start with the turbo piece. And, and if it's as simple as GPT moves faster and works harder for us. Um, I'm I'm sure it's not because it's how that's the sentence that sticks out to me, but I'm sure you guys have much more richness to expand on there. Sure. Yeah, so do, you uh, add, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can say that, um, at least in my mind, that was actually uh, underratedly one of the most significant 
announcements from OpenAI. Uh, the idea that the costs of GPT-4, which is already the most powerful AI model in the world, uh, or, or generally available AI model in the world, uh, the cost is being cut so significantly, right, to a third of what it is currently, as well as the token context, right, the amount of information that can be put into it being increased so significantly. Um, I think it's under, I think it's possibly underrated by some how many horizons that opens up for very sophisticated uses of, uh, of AI because one of the biggest limits for commercializing AI, right, for companies that are using AI is the enormous costs that come with stuffing uh, huge amounts of token uh, into an LLM model, right? OpenAI says that they have a 120,000 token context uh, window. That seems like a large amount because it used to be 32K or 8K, depending on the model that you're using, but it's really not. It's a drop in the bucket compared to what more sophisticated users of these products actually require in order to deliver great products. But the fact that they've increased it so significantly will allow us as we continue to improve at least what we do here at, at Wonder, which is, you know, involves many, many, many different prompts and combining enormous amounts of information, um, you know, from the web and elsewhere, um, that will greatly increase uh, our capacity to include even more of that, right, and become even more creative in our uses. Uh, and I think we'll find that generally for many other companies as well, uh, that this is a, a very exciting time to be building. 100%. Yeah, I mean, echo everything that, that Shmu said there. I think when uh, when the news was shared about that, I think we, we were also doing some some really cool experiments to figure out, okay, how do we make our, our next version of all of the research automation that we're doing uh, just so much better? And one of the big pieces that came up was, oh, this might actually 5x the cost. Well, we actually got handed a boon in here where maybe it doesn't do that. Right, and that that changes the nature from a product perspective and a business perspective, where we can start to deploy these technologies. Where previously, where we might have to hide that behind a paywall or hide that behind some you know some level to make it much more exclusive, we now actually are able to put our own level of democratization on the deployment of that software through our application, just as. OpenAI is democratizing itself, democratizing a lot of the underlying LLM technology so that you know all these applications can be built on top of it, which is also a really cool um, uh, part of the news around actually opening up this sort of GPT store that they're, that they're thinking about doing. And I remember we were talking to an OpenAI rep close to a year ago, uh, whenever they were, they were mentioning that actually their, their goal isn't to build a specific application, it's to build the app store. Uh, and it's really cool to see a lot of that stuff now come to life where, okay, now anyone can, can go in and, and start to build these, these new GPT apps. That last piece yeah. is so I mean, transformative, I feel like in a lot of different ways, especially as people have had the last couple of months to tinker and explore and like try and build even bots for I'm thinking of Lenny, you know, his podcast and his content, he's tried to build a bot for himself. And now this thing is probably going to like help him do it in five minutes. Um, before we dig too far into that, just to take one step backward into um, this new like model comes out. Can you talk us through, like, even using Wonder as an example, what does it tangibly change? And I'm curious as much on the front end as on the back end. Like, do you have to push anything live or like re, you know, wire all the code or whatever so that it can handle more and that constraints that we had controlled for so that we didn't break whatever um, now you know, can work with this expanded capacity? And then on the front end, what does that mean for how users can now engage with us or what we can now build to transform our experience? I know Anish, you mentioned less about like paywalls and we're being really concerned about that piece, but is there anything else on the front end when our users are coming to us to conduct research and ask questions and get their deliverable back um, that meaningfully changes? Yeah, definitely can, can chat about the first piece and then should we maybe want to take uh uh yeah speak more intelligently to like what needs to happen on, on the back end for us to to deploy these these new models um yeah on the front end i think there there's a lot of places now where previously we may need and still maybe in the short run we may need to have humans in the loop to be able to deliver a specific uh for example let's call it um a chart 
that's one of the big things that that's been on our minds recently at Wonder is okay, how do we for a specific report, for a specific analysis that we did, create a chart that best matches and helps the the customer digest that information as seamlessly as possible and as quickly as possible, especially if they're going sharing with colleagues or or to their partners. Um, right now, a lot of that process is manual, right? And I think that with a lot of these tools that we're now able to, to incorporate specifically through Code Interpreter now having access through the API in that front, we can hopefully take away some of the time that's now being spent manually trying to create these images and using code interpreter as well and automatically create it through through you know through our prompt chains that we're building or in, in our in our agents that we're building. So that's one example, right, of, of a place where okay, actually the access to these different models will meaningfully change the customer experience. Um, as well as the the cost that's associated with developing that customer experience. Very yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll um, I'll jump in. I can jump in on the uh, on the other half of it. Um, unless you have something for for Inesh. No. No. Um, no. No. I was right. curious to hear your take. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I think um, everything Inesh said is one hundred percent correct, and I, I would add to it. I think the big um, the big change or or kind of the big advantage um, or, or progress made by OpenAI is one of convenience. Things that were previously very manual and difficult to do, like Anisha was saying, like creating the correct graph or image, et cetera, now becomes easier. But it's not a change in terms of what actually can be done if you put your mind to it. In other words, everything that, that currently is there right now, right? The ability to create graphs, the ability to have, you know, a custom prompt um, are all things that could already be built manually. But I think the big advantage and the big gift that AI, open AI, maybe not gift, but the big uh, advantage that open AI is giving to everyone now is, is greater convenience. It's easier to make all these things. It's easier to have an interface and to be able to focus on the prompts and the and the chains and all the other more sophisticated things in the back end, um, which is which is amazing. Um, I I would say um, the int it's interesting because on the wonder end the, the implications are are fascinating, right? Because we can now make a choice to leverage some of these convenience tools to just make some of the things that we do uh, easier and more convenient. Um, but on the kind of prompting side and the context windows and, and, and things like that, um, it's interesting because we are constantly experimenting uh, with just new tools, new chains. Um, we have a huge network of kind of uh, uh, chains and databases and um, all sorts of things that leverage AI behind the scenes that um, um, that require a lot of experimentation. And for many of those experiments, we ended up shelving them because you're like, you know what, these are really promising, but the cost isn't worth it right now. However, we know in one year, two years, three years, whatever, the costs are really gonna come down and we can now move those experiments into production and think very seriously about them. Well, that day wasn't a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, it was like next month. So um, that allows us to put in a lot of these things that we know are going to be very useful from doing tens of thousands of client research projects over the last, 10 years, right, all of a sudden, we can start putting that uh, into practice in addition to everything we've already done. I think, um, you know, a lot of it is also just like nice, right, in the sense that like, we've made decisions that the quality of the product that we put out using AI or kind of augmenting with AI, right, because we, we uh, rely a lot on our on our analysts to, to make something that can't be made with AI alone. Um, but the quality that we put out with AI is enough to justify us actually spending, uh, putting the input, spending the money to actually consume a lot of tokens because we know we're, we know we're going to have an amazing product. Uh, and so for us, the price going down doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do more things because we already said that we already doubled down on doing more things. Those are already in active development but it's convenient because now it's cheaper and we can think of doing even more, right? Before we're gonna do something, now we'll do three X of it because the price has gone down by one third, right? Um, we wanna make sure that the end result of, of uh, and, and I hope all companies are making this decision to the extent that they can, that the end result shouldn't be three times cheaper, it should be three times higher quality. 
Yeah, amazing. Um, when we then think about so there's the companies and how they're handling these developments, and then going back to that point around GPTs, and again, I need to like figure out better language because chat GPT is going to quickly get confusing with GPTs and like, you know, my little own package of custom instructions doesn't really roll off the tongue, but um, how we think about individuals who are maybe building their own solutions, but then, you know, there's corporate tools or cool free AI things that are out there that they could be using instead of their own um, pieces or, you know, whatever they've created. I'm just curious for it to like have a little bit of a conversation. I'd be interested if anybody in the audience has experimented with AI tools and now feels like they have the toolkit they need to build something that can work harder for them. Um, but how we think about that distinction between what people can do on their own now, but then where the line will stop because the companies can take it much further because of whatever other reason, um, or just in general, any comments you have around what this now means people can turn to the app store or create their own solutions in-house, so to speak. Yeah, I think um, i happy to, to take a step. I haven't done admittedly enough thinking on the consumer side of it, but I, I think what we'll, we'll start to see is just like, a, it will be a marketplace for these one-off tools that there are already smaller companies like AIPRM that's like doing things like this in that space that this effectively, you know, serves as a, as a possible competitor to to that because now we're saying hey like you have this thing that's useful now go out and make money on it because you can now put it on the app store people can download it if it's useful for them they'll open it i will pay you or the, i don't know exactly how, how the monetization model works but i know that you can get paid as a creator of these mm -hmm. prompts right it's creating a whole new sort of input for or like a monetization stream for the creator account which is really cool i think on the business side um Enterprises now actually will be able to create their own enterprise, like within their enterprise only version of the GPT, which I think is really interesting, especially when in the wonder specific instance, because we have our way of doing research. We have our ways of maybe looking at, hey, whenever we need to triangulate something, what are the different strategies that we might want to put into play that's that's built over the 10 years and 185,000 plus projects that we've completed. Um, a lot of those things will be really interested for the wonder specific use case. And I can see that in consulting, I can see that being useful in, in really many in really many innovative spaces where you know especially whenever you're at a you get onboarded at, at, a, at a large company there's like a typical like a way of thinking that happens and i think if there's some ways to codify it in a in um in an llm plus you add the input of you can now process own files that you upload and and operate on your own internal context i can see some really powerful use cases in there i do wonder you know, if this ends up becoming something like a Salesforce COE situation where you have, you know, each each team within a, within a larger company kind of has their own resident experts that are great at building these GPTs. Shmil, do you have any thoughts on this front? Uh, like more like, um, I guess, relatedly, because uh, I think an issues analysis is correct. And I agree, it's, it's so early, you know, that the, we can only we can only project and 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 predict uh, after a, a whole twenty four hours uh, post release. Uh, I would say that I think the there's an interesting implication for kind of the importance of prompt engineering for different people who use LLMs now. Right, I think for the everyday user, um, the importance of prompt engineering skills has has gone down slightly because there's about to be a deluge uh, deluge of apps or custom GPTs that effectively are there to make it so that you don't have to figure out what the correct prompt is. They're going to create the prompt beforehand for you. Uh, and so for the everyday user, um, that's a huge advantage. I think for the people who are making these tools and custom GPTs and uh, uh, apps, the importance of prompt engineering has skyrocketed because I think I mean, because OpenAI has created such an amazing incentive for people to be innovating, right? Hopefully they can monetize this if it's, if it's successful. And it's kind of, the, you know, the winner is going to be the one with the best and most sophisticated prompts that find a good fit. I think for kind of enterprise users or, or people or, or companies that are um, doing much more complex things that can't actually be contained in like a single chat GPT session, um, which, you know, are more the kind of things that, that we'd be doing at Wonder, doesn't really change. Uh, the importance of uh, 
amazing product engineering has always been sky high uh, and it will continue to be. Um, that That's kind of one of the premises that we went into AI with, which is that domain expertise makes good AI great. Uh, and so we felt AI could be uh, an amazing use case for us because we have so many analysts who have worked on hundreds of thousands of hours of projects who can now work with us uh, on the engineering side to create these very sophisticated prompts and chains. Um, so for enterprise users, it will remain about the same. Very important. For everyone else, it's a very interesting change in dynamic. Yeah, thinking of, I mean, our analysts are so proficient I mean, like truly experts, as you said, Shmuel, on the prompt engineering side of things, domain experts in not only how to use different LLMs, but like where do you use different plugins and then domain specific either sources to turn to or creative approaches. This is an interesting intersection when we think about across all of the ways and the types of projects, well, the ways we help our clients and the projects that we do. If there's, you know, market sizing, there might be creative approaches that we've uncovered to do this and then this and then this and you ask it certain things certain ways and it becomes now a package that you pull off the shelf and kind of run versus um, almost having to internalize it and it in the same way that ai has accelerated where your research can start because ai can get you to 50 percent or 80 percent and now you can take it to 150 percent instead of well my time's up i'm done at 100 this feels interesting for the domain expertise and the prompt engineering prowess is not going to stop for our analysts it's just going to become starting from a higher you know or, you know farther along starting line or whatever and they can only go further and do more so um, all these developments feel I, I mean there's certainly the naysayers and the worriers around doomsday for like humans and the value in this but i feel like as we've said it's you know people who use ai will be the future versus like ai truly being the future so i'm, I'm excited to see where our analysts to continue to take this because it's been impressive so far. Um, not sure if there's any other thoughts or comments on that front, but. I agree. <laughs> totally, I think I'm constantly surprised by by the new use cases that our analysts come up with. Um, yeah, I mean, we could we could list out those use cases as, <laughs> uh, till, till the end of this call, but um, but yeah, I think that it, there's, there's just so much more that we don't even know yet what the third inning will hold. I, I still think we're at the bottom of the first right now. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe to double click into one piece of this though, because we've talked and, you know, Wonder stands by asking better questions is the best way to get better answers, um, let alone make better decisions off of those answers. And so if we think about like Gen Pop, the average user of any of these LLMs now just turning to this library of apps and they can, you know, AI PRM has done a great job of making a lot of these available and you theoretically can 10x your impact and your output because you're using existing prompts. Where does the distinction between now I don't have to learn prompt engineering because there's something somewhere that's going to like get me started or, or have done the work to ask the things that I should have been asking or prompting where I needed to versus there's still questions that like need to be articulated and needs that need to be conveyed that like if you go off on the wrong direction you're just going to be way off at the end of the road no matter what i don't know if i'm articulating this well but sort of the the prompt engineering like the handicap or you know whatever the the lanes on the bowling alley are going to be there soon so does that change people's ability to ask the right questions or do we still see those as very meaningfully different things yeah, I'm, I'm going to start here, Shmoo, and then feel free to, to, to hop in after. I think the the my the, the way that I have this um, those two oriented in my head is that the asking the right questions is all about how do we tilt the rocket ship in the right way, and the prompt engineering is actually what allows us to blast off and get more done faster. So I think they're they're fundamentally two different things. Um, so I I don't see all of the you know the pieces that OpenAI has launched as like, okay, now we're helping actually aim the rocket ship in the right direction. More so when that rocket ship is aimed in the right direction, let's actually give more firepower to all the great things that AI can do. I think, yeah, you highlight a really interesting point though, that yes, I think people are starting to realize, uh, which is the one thing that we, I think we've, we've been 
um, ahead of the game on is the importance of asking the right question. I have no doubt that as time goes on, more and more people will start to realize actually the direction of a rocket ship really matters. Um, and within each of those custom prompts that they're building, like whether it's sort of a video storyboarding tool or a trip planning tool, it'll start much more with a question asking phase and maybe lean a little bit more heavily in that in the UI versus, um, you know, versus just going straight for the answer. Yeah, I, I would add that, you know, I, I, I think we all know intuitively, right, like that not all questions are created equal because they're so context dependent, right? So the questions that someone would ask in a sales call is just so different than the question, right, a um, uh, manager might ask a direct report or, you know, you might ask someone about a, a review. Um, and I think one of the things that we've come to appreciate um, because we've adopted this question asking strategy kind of on principle, right? Because that, that's kind of, that is one of our principles um, that the world should be curious um, because we've adopted it so early and have had, and have used questions as one of our primary ways to ingest project research projects from our clients. We've had to, we've had the opportunity to go through so many iterations, realizing that not all questions are created equal, starting in the beginning when we were first experimenting with this from questions that frankly were not helpful to anyone, either our analysts, our clients, our AI, all the way to, I mean, countless iterations later, things that are truly useful and interesting. And I think that uh, kind of to uh, open AI, one of the shifts that has been made is that the kind of challenge of prompting has shifted from can you engineer a prompt to one of searchability. Can you find the person that's created the right prompt for you? And I think that's still an unanswered question that we'll figure out more over time as this is released, to what extent has searchability been solved, which was one of the huge issues with, um, with plugins, right, with OpenAI plugins. And so um, I think that would be a, um, a big unanswered question. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, asking the right questions for the right context and the right domain, um, as I may said, is is going to be critical. How did the gate pieces come into this? So there's been some recent research from MIT and Stanford, and I think in Anthropic as well, um, this idea of generative active task elicitation where the LLM can sort of talk back to you or elicit information around your ask from you. Um, it's been discussed as like, this is sort of where the future of, or the next step of, of AI and LLMs adding value will head, um, but sort of exactly to what we were just talking about there. Do you see this becoming table stakes? It'll be part of everything. Now we've done, we, you all have done amazing work, especially when you think about the product and the pipes that need to like train the models to make this happen so that a user coming to wonder feels like they're talking to a human with the questions and the scoping and that do you really, you know, mean this or do you, would you also want to explore that? And it feels very intuitive for the industry, for the ask, for the use case at hand. So it can get very complex, but there, there's a lot of work that's gone into what we've built here. So I'm curious if you feel like you know, we're only very, very early innings of everybody being able to incorporate that into their models or soon enough, it'll be just a table stake everywhere. I, oh, go ahead, Anish. Um, yeah, I was just, I was just going to maybe say that I think it'll really depend on the consumer preferences um, for each specific thing, right? I think that like, you know, whenever I go to Google, and I ask for the nearest Thai restaurant. I don't want it to then ask me like, you know, how far away do you want this to be? I kind of told you like, what do you want their spice? Like it could theoretically ask like what my spice preferences are to that. But I, I don't think that as a consumer, I'd probably trade that off. I'd trade my time. I, would, I wouldn't trade my time off for that extra accuracy. Um, and I, I think that it will be a, a finally a question that every company that is building an AI related tool will have to naturally ask themselves, like, what is the right level of understanding here where there is some level of time trade off that a customer or a user has to put into it, but also some level of escalation of commitment that now they feel a lot better, maybe about the output. And how does that then impact the user experience? Um, so hard to say whether it should be a hard and fast rule, whether all should incorporate it versus not all should incorporate it. I think it is 
maybe a hard and fast rule that everyone should think about what the right level is. Yeah, I think I think people will experiment with it. It's just going to be another you know arrow to add to our quiver, right? Of ways that we come up with with you know good prompts, right? Can we have an LLM ask us questions, and then when we answer them, come up with a prompt that will handle new novel situations, right? Is is the basic idea, um, and it's definitely a strategy people should try, and we'll see kind of how it plays out over time. I think the biggest thing I would think of there is, you know, how do you there's a big difference, right, in coming up with a good prompt and then productizing a prompt. Because a good prompt, right, just needs to be better than the other prompts. But productizing a prompt needs to get it right 98% of the time, 100% of the time. And when you're dealing with something, especially kind of gritty, real life complex problems, right, getting 100% consistency is actually very, very difficult. Um, and that's kind of for, for serious players who want to really use AI in meaningful and impactful ways to, to you know, increase the, their success, you have to get something that has a hundred percent that has a hundred percent accuracy or as close to that as possible. And I, my guess is that it will be a very useful quiver, uh, a very useful arrow in our quiver. Um, but I, I think we should kind of look out to see whether it can handle those edge cases and take a prompt from from you know better to adequate, which is 100%. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense when you think about the different, you know, whether it's the consumer use case or the restaurant use case, or again, a market sizing for a potential massive investment. These elements of there's a time trade off makes a lot of sense, the escalation of commitment. There's also sort of the degree of competence required, going even to the rocket analogy that you can have like a great prompt, but if it's in the wrong direction, like, you know, does it really add the value that either your business needs? Whereas, like, okay, I just like type in for another Thai restaurant or, you know, can and I'm going to rework the copy that came back from the content draft regardless versus, um, again, maybe going down the wrong rabbit hole of investments or something more, more significant. Interesting thoughts there. Um, anything else from Dev Day that you would highlight as potentially either really game changing or maybe even being overhyped that uh, you saw come up? I just, I mean, I think the, there's definitely going to be some interesting pieces around um, around everything to do with retrieval and being able to upload your own documents and be able to have your own stores in there. Um, I think of that, especially for the enterprise case, I think, you know, after speaking with plenty of enterprise folks that are, you know, living and breathing, how do we adjust and incorporate this tool? One of the consistent themes that have come up is how do we use these tools to search through our internal documentation a lot better? Um, and, you know, I know there are, there are definitely plenty of companies that are, that are trying to tackle that problem. I do wonder, you know, as OpenAI gets more and more entrenched, both in enterprise as well as in, in retrieval, like, is that, if that, if that becomes a space that they play in, uh, it could be super interesting. I could see it having a lot of value to, to enterprise customers, I guess, rather to the enterprise segment. Is this getting into the RAG territory? That's what kind of the, the premise of what's going on there. Can you take us through what the kind of like the, the crawl, walk, run of that looks like, either how we're thinking about it or just in general, how companies might might want to start thinking about embracing it? Sure, I'm not sure if that, uh, that might be sure. better for, for you to handle. That's, that's, that sounds like a good question for me. Um, so RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation exists to solve one very, very important problem. How do you get useful answers and prevent hallucinations? In other words, there's a, there's a vital problem with LMs that I'm sure most of us are familiar with, which is if you ask it something that it doesn't know, very often it won't say, I don't know, which is already not, you know, the most useful answer to you, but it'll actually just make up fake things, um, fake data, which obviously can be very harmful. Um, and is especially for a business is you know a deal breaker. So retrieval augmented generation rates right? so a reg is a way to feed data that you know is real and relevant to an LLM and say, hey, use this data that I've pre-given you in order to form your response instead of potentially making up your own response. Uh, and then you have all those potential downsides. And so 
there are a lot of ways, I mean, there are a lot of other ways to kind of deal with AI hallucination, which is obviously a, a, a huge obstacle to tackle. But the for, for RAG specifically, there's a lot that goes into it that I guess we think about, including, for example, what are your data sources? Where are you getting your, your, your data from? How relevant is the data that you're sending? Um, so for example, you could be getting data from the internet, you can be getting it from databases, you can get from third party vendors who have, you know, pre, uh, um, or pre vetted the data, uh, in, in some cases. So that's kind of the, the first question. The second question is, how do you find that data, right? Let's say that data is out there and you know where to get it from. How do you take a client's problem or a client's ask and turn that into the appropriate queries or the appropriate methodologies to find the data that they're actually looking for. Because there's a lot of it out there, but for a particular client's ask, 99.99999% of it is useless. I would say the next issue is, okay, once you have gotten the correct data, right, how do you tease out the most important parts, right? Let's say I have 100 you know, pages of text and I know the information is likely in there somewhere. How do I get at the most relevant bits considering again, what we mentioned before your constraints, right? You can't just send a billion characters of text into an LLM, right? A, because it's impossible, but B, because in most cases and B, because it's very expensive. So how do you do it in a way that's efficient and gets incredible results? And that's kind of the, the next part, which is retrieving the most uh, impactful nuggets of information and then putting those into kind of the final analysis that will be sent to the client. So all of those obviously have layers and layers and layers and layers within each of them that, that kind of make them more powerful and sophisticated, but in a very kind of large, larger uh, sense, that's, that's kind of a way to think about uh, reg. So to maybe make this super tangible and thinking about where and how you're thinking about it with our research OS, um, sort of what we've built to equip our analysts to accelerate their efforts. There's also an element and maybe even to take a, a big step backwards um, to recap our, our process. If I'm coming to wonder to do that market sizing that apparently is, is stuck on my mind today of, um, you know, the growth rate and the current players, um, but in general, just kind of the, the dollar value of a given product I'm thinking about in a certain market. And I first interact with Wonders Clarification Engine. So we've talked about today, today this element of asking better questions and how does it help kind of translate the human conversation that typically happens around scoping a research effort into a very quick, pithy, but effective and, um, you know, at first very divergent creative, but then very convergent, helpful, directed inquiry that we then take into research, which um, the kind of short term result is immediate results that hit your inbox, quick recap of um, anything that's out there. And this is where the research OS really fuels a lot of that, that first, um, it, you know, it used to be very manual, but now it takes you almost 50, 80% of the way. And then the next step that happens is our analysts with all of their expertise, their prompt engineering, but also their research science and, you know, digital research prowess, build on what's come out of the research OS and, you know, verifying all the sources, all that good stuff. But then again, they can go to now 150% because they're starting at a farther along starting point to augment any of those findings and really get a, a robust and concrete answer to the original question. So when we talk about research OS is that middle step and, um, you know, it plays into the third step, but maybe it'd be interesting to, to make RAG really tangible in terms of you know, whatever ask you want to use, whether it's market sizing or otherwise, what happens on the back end? And how do we how do we make sure that the results that are coming back are, again, relevant and, and accurate to your point? It's a great question. I, I'm not going to go too deep in the details. Um, a, so we don't. Lose I'll cut you off the, and we'll have to bleep yeah, it out. Also it's just, it's, <laughs> and it also because it's proprietary. Um, but, I, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we do there that are um that are unique to us that have come from a lot of experimentation um but i'll, I'll say kind of in a in a more in a more general sense um this is kind of you know through painful experience speaks to what i um was mentioning earlier about the difference between something that's good and something that's amazing um because especially with something like research right even taking the example that that you mentioned right get me a market sizing right? 
there are so many inputs to what counts as a good market setting that depends a lot on the context, right? Geographically, is it specific to the US or is it the entire world? Is it for specific dates? You know, if it's for a certain market, does it need to include certain companies, right? Or does it need to include certain segments, right? Sub-segments of that market, right? Maybe we want biotech companies that do X, Y, and Z, but only startups within the last couple of years. And so I think um, the, the ask itself kind of kind of peels away to reveal a lot of the things that we have to do and we have to think about in order to get something that's actually useful, right? Which is something that is extremely reflective, that can self-repair, right? That can that can identify um, um, all the different sub asks, right, or sub problems within a larger problem, um, and kind of uh, um, tackle those in a very logical way. And so those are kind of uh, without going too deep into it, those are kind of, uh, the ask itself helps kind of illustrate the kinds of things that we need to think about and solve in order to get a really good result. Yeah, I think, um, it, it, I think what we've realized, right, is that so many of these, like, we don't get simple questions. Like, if we compared the questions that we got, you know, six years ago, probably even eight years ago, compared to the questions that we get today, they're night and day, very different because we're serving one a different type of customer that has a much more unique ask. And because the, there's, these aren't the quick Google searches anymore. They aren't the, you know, the quick, like, oh, I can just get this answer right away. It's more the, okay, this has multiple parts to it. How do we break down tasks and, and into their relevant subtasks and all that stuff that you mentioned. And also, I think one of the things that we realized through our early experimentation is that, hey, whenever you give AI a very broad mandate, it tends to give you very poor results. Um, and I think the whole process of dividing things into subtests allow us to, um, to deliver more, deliver magic much more consistently because we're constraining the AI um, in, in that way. So I'd say, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of cool things, I think, as we look to the future, and especially a lot of these tools that have come out from Dev Day and not just from OpenAI, but from other folks that help us then think about, okay, what do these next versions of research OS and, and RAG look like in, in our wonder specific use case. So maybe a perfect segue. We have, of course, Elon Musk coming onto the scene with Grok out this week. Uh, I'd be curious for your take. Any commentary there is more than welcome, but more in the spirit of there's new players. There's, you know, Microsoft has its version. We have all these different manifestations. Um, and there's probably gonna be a few more other like models, each theoretically. Grok has a strong point of view on like, you know, personality and humor and, and whatever. But theoretically, we start to get to a point where there's competition and there's unique differentiators and kind of value props of each of these different tools. Just curious for your thoughts on the landscape. Like, do you think we'll still get to a point where all of them are going to still try and race to like similar and then they'll start to differentiate that we're going to start to see some bifurcation and you know, going in different directions, and doubling down on A versus B, um, it's probably total speculation, but just curious for either, either of your takes. Yeah, I'm happy to see, oh, actually, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say like my, uh, my sense is that, and again, I haven't um, looked, you know, I haven't, I haven't, uh, you know, used it extensively, but my sense is that, you know, the, the offering from, from X is kind of focused or, or the big selling point, at least right now, is that it has real-time information. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is something that is um, that can potentially be quite unique. Um, it's obviously scraping from a very data-rich source. We'll see kind of what the outcomes from that are. Um, at the very least, it'll be interesting. Um, but I, I do think that that kind of is, is a unique twist on it, though I think ultimately everyone will be sprinting uh, as well as to try to kind of get to that generalist level of usefulness that uh, OpenAI has very much achieved. Yeah, I agree hundred percent, Shmu. Um, yeah, it's so funny because uh, I feel like Musk said this, I think like 10, 15 years ago about SpaceX and how he wants other competitors to join in that, in, in sort of that uh, private space race so that there'd be more funding and more eyes on on the thing. And now he's, you know, sort of joining on, on um, you know, on the AI game. And granted, he's been, he's been, you know, an investor in it for, for a while now, but it's, um, it, I think it's really cool to just see more money come into this. I think what we will see is, uh, 
a base set of features like real time, uh, sort of real time search and, and things like that, that will be generally useful. Uh, that I think a lot of these companies will continue to, to sprint to. And as a lot of these other players maybe develop one of these features that seem generally useful, then I think we'll get now more of the copycats to then bring them in. It's like incredible to see that over the course of a few months, they've been able to create a model that's already at chat GP, at GPT 3.5 level, uh, which is incredible to see, but also kind of just says, okay, wait, if you can catch up in a few months, is being a few months behind a discouragement for you to even enter the game. I imagine not for these companies because the size of the prize is, is, is so large. Um, but then over time, yeah, we'll see whenever eventually there, there might be a time whenever there needs to be some level of specialization into a specific use case and differentiation. Uh, my, my gut says that we're still far from that point and that there's still a lot of generic features that um, need to be built for this to, to become generally useful for both, um, both the public and also for, for professional setting as well. What do you think the prize is here that there becomes a new replacement for like, there's theoretically one Google, right? Like you say, I'm going to Google something. You don't say I'm going to go like scan across six different search engines and pick the one that, you know, tells me the best Thai restaurant that I'm happy with. So what is, what's the end game do you think for all of these big models? Oh, one, I'll say I'm definitely not qualified to, to really answer that question, but I can, I can, I can throw in a, a speculate. I mean, I think, you know, there's so much work that, that gets done that, um, that these models now possibly allow to get done better, faster, and cheaper than a human doing it alone. And I don't think that's, or a human doing it in, in conjunction. And I think if we look at just what the services and also just the, the manufacturing, all, all these different sectors, what the economy looks like today, I think it will be revolutionized by, by AI and, and what the model looks like for these AI companies and these tech companies to take, um, you know, to take margin from existing um, existing industries that is yet to be sort of seen, but the applications of it are so widespread that I can only imagine that it is uh, a lot of T's in that in the uh, in the in the trillions of uh, of dollars in terms of the actual space that, that they're playing. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I'll I'll be curious hear your thoughts too as well, Shmuel. But um, that you're thinking about it in terms of the replacement, like the the status quo that it's replacing or the time spent. And then, you know, there's other value that companies can create now that they're outsourcing whatever to any of the, the AI or LLM tools. Um, I was originally thinking like you have, you know, line up these eight or 10 different LLMs, like what does winning look like? Is it that most people turn to that first? Is it kind of like, I'm you know, thinking brand world, unneeded awareness. And this is the one that I think of when as a synonym for AI, is it they eventually monet, one can monetize it. Another one becomes the source for the app store. Are there 10 or 15 app stores that we're all just like, well, there's 10 different LLMs and there's 10 different app stores. And we're all, you know, at some point competition and capitalism will probably come into play. But uh, yeah, interesting take there. Yeah, totally. yeah, totally. I would add on the uh, kind of on the technical side or, or on the, you know, the engineering uses of, of LLMs um, that for the most part, engineers will be fair weather friends to, 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 uh, to LLMs, right? We'll use whatever gets our clients the best results. So if OpenAI right now has the best model, we'll use it. Another day in the future, if someone else has the best model, we'll use them because at the end of the day, what we want is to get the best results for our end users. Um, you know, I think there's um, something really useful that's happening on the engineering side of the world right now, which is the development of tools that make it very easy to swap between LLMs, which is kind of driving some of this decision making, or at least helping us make better decisions for our clients. I think that will continue to be uh, continue to be the case. I expect there to be very, very fierce competition. Uh, between different um, providers of LLMs to be kind of the top dog, uh, as, as the saying goes, and to be the ones who engineers turn to when they want to solve very difficult problems. Are there top of mind um, problems or frustration points or friction points that you're seeing now that none of these providers are 
yet addressing or you feel like something will be coming soon but um sort of like a like the hallucinations thing is a is a good example of like so, this has got to solve be solved like someone's got to fix this anything else that you're experiencing or or kind of holding out hope that will get solved here i think yeah i think the hallucination piece is, is the big one that dominates um you know that dominates my mind i i wonder you know i think how the hallucination problem has been framed is how do these LLMs solve it? And I, I do wonder if it is actually the LLMs problem to solve or if there are other creative solutions in here. Like even one thing that, uh, you know, Shmuel and I were talking about earlier today was, could you have multiple LLMs possibly check the results of one and kind of create your own sort of peer review system as it relates mm. to the hallucination space? And so I, I think maybe, yeah, hallucinations is probably the biggest one that's top of mind. I, I just wonder what are the other solutions out there that isn't just about LLMs solving that problem? Like you can get all the great stuff of LLMs, but there might be other other ways to solve these other challenges. Yeah, I think Anish is totally right on, on the hallucination side. Um, I, I would add that because there are so many people thinking about AI right now, there are very few like AI problems that like haven't been at least thought about or, or, or that people are kind of in the process of addressing. And so hallucination, hallucinations is, is a great example. And you know, Anish uh, mentioned one, you know, one of many, many, many different strategies that can be taken to address it. But I'll give another, I, I heard someone um, recently uh, on a podcast talk about how uh, you know, LLMs, you know, they hallucinate so much. Like if you try and do simple math that you can do in a calculator, right? Like let's say you want to multiply two 10 digit numbers, right? Many LLMs, uh, maybe all LLMs would, would potentially be hallucinate the response. So what do you do about that? Can just like LLMs no longer do math, right? Or, or can LLMs not do math at all? Um, and the answer is that, that you know, we're, we're all working on solutions to that. So for example, code, right? Actual code can multiply numbers very easily. That's how a calculator does it. So instead, what you can do is have the LLM just output the two numbers that need to be multiplied, right? And then you can have code parse those numbers out, multiply them together, and get the result back to the LLM. And all of a sudden, the hallucination problem, at least for math in this specific case, has been solved. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to continue to be a problem, but it's going to continue to be a solvable problem um, that that kind of in each domain are going to require um, um, very bespoke and uh, in some cases very sophisticated solutions. And in many cases, um, you know, humans are going to remain the ultimate source of accuracy and, uh, and creativity in this regard. Um, and that's definitely something that uh, is kind of a superpower for many companies that have the humans on their end who are specialists. I think um, to kind of add a, a second um, a second problem is that a lot of tools that are being right, built right now with LLMs, um, again, are, are, um, are good enough, right? Or, or good, or they're interesting, right? And you use them and you're like, huh, that's a cool idea. Or you use them and you say like, oh, that's like a pretty like, you know, generic response, but like, it was fun to use that and see what it was. And like, maybe I'll share it with a friend so that they could see like how cool it is, you know, how far AI is coming. But most of these tools, you wouldn't actually use them day to day. Um, and I think that very frequently it's because companies are being founded that um, because either they have to move very fast or because, you know, sometimes they don't have the underlying domain expertise. They're trying to use AI to solve every part of the problem that they're trying that right in, under their domain, whether it's creating graphs or creating images or, you know, doing some other function, right? Ordering things. And um, I think companies that have the advantage are companies that have pre-existing products that they know work and have domain expertise in that, pro in that, in that product. And what they're able to do is say, hey, I have this product that works 100% of the time. How can I strategically apply AI to the places where it's most appropriate in order to 100x the quality of the responses or how uh, accessible it is or how fast it is? Um, and I think that is kind of a big obstacle for new companies. Um, fortunately for us, we've been around for 10 years. Uh, and so it's you know something that we can very much leverage because that's what we have built. And now we have the luxury of applying AI exactly where we need it um, and keeping it out where it's not helpful or actually harmful. 
So maybe a perfect segue in the last couple of minutes here. Um, thinking of Wonder specifically and all of the things that you're working on, and you know, we've got we've had a number of exciting developments and releases in the last couple of months. There's infinite more down the pipe. We'll just keep everybody here caffeinated. Um, I'm curious for you know one or two things that you're comfortable sharing that you're especially excited for, especially excited for as we look into Q4 and kind of what's ahead on the 2024 docket for us and, and you know the impact it'll have on our customers and their ability to do research. Yeah, I'm happy to start here. This is maybe a little bit more um, uh, far reaching. I think one of the places that um, as we specifically think about the professional search use case, one of the big question marks or like areas of opportunity rather are the, the underlying data sources that we use to then generate the analyses that we are providing to, um, to customers. I think in this new world where so many things are now very data oriented, like these previous companies that were like proprietary databases that just sort of sort of sold licenses so, so that people could just like log in and pull data are now all forced to adapt to have different like sort of data packages that they offer and APIs that they allow us to call. And really exciting to see all of these companies sort of shift towards that model. One of the one of the big things that we're thinking about is again, all to improve the quality of the outputs that we deliver to our customers to understand which of those data sources are relevant to a specific problem that we have and then go out and make sure that we can acquire that data and get that data in real time to then feed into what the research OS version and model output looks like. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of promising uh, pieces in there to help get that data that is like currently hidden out there to the right people at the right time. And I think that, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of possibility there for us to, to play in. Yeah, I would say on my end, um, uh, kind of uh, almost counterintuitively, um, I'm excited actually for kind of our continuing process and processes improvements. Um, something I mentioned before is that what we really believe in kind of based on a lot of experience now is that the best uses of AI require domain expertise. And that's kind of how we develop our props. And one thing that we are continually working on and, and um, are continually kind of double down, uh, doubling down on with kind of our playground experience and the analysts who we loop in to, to help with our uh, with our prompt development is the process of uh, the iterative process of taking our good prompts, um, you know, make taking our great prompts and making them even better, and taking our good prompts that were like, hey, they're not ready for the, you know for production yet, and making them production ready because we have so many ideas and so many um, you know um, opportunities. Uh, to do that. And so as we continually develop our feedback loop, right, which is where we have, right, we have, we do so much research, right, we need to identify exactly the places where AI does things right, and exactly where AI does things wrong. Um, and that's a processes uh, part, or, or kind of where we can improve AI. And so as we continue to double down on that, I think the rate at which we innovate will increase even more, um, which hopefully is something a lot of companies are, are working on, uh, but it's definitely top of mind for us here. Amazing. I think if, if there's one sense that rings true for everything that we're about, it's helping companies innovate more and innovate faster and love that um, we're able to cover today a lot of what's behind how we're doing that. But um, that brings us to the top of the hour. I can't thank you enough for the perspective and, and some of the hot takes, but also some of the really rich insights and, and knowledge you dropped with us today. Um, the recording will be shared after, of course, and if anybody has any questions or wants to dig deeper on any of this, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Otherwise, we will see you in the new year for the, the new version of Sandbox that will be, will be coming live. But thanks for being along for the journey and have a, have a great rest of the day, everyone. One, two,